All right. Welcome to part three of the interview with Christopher Moore. It's been a pleasure having you listen to this in your car or in your basement or in your spaceship or in your cellar or if you're a tiny person stuck in a bottle, something like that. I don't know. You know, stranger things have happened probably. What I'm trying to say here is that I appreciate the fact that you are listening to this podcast right now. So cheers. With all of the novels that you write, you're making your mark on the world. And I'm not trying to get all grandiose here or anything, but I've read about how doctors sometimes tell patients, you need to take a vacation and read some Christopher Moore books. Or, or even me, when I'm recommending your books, which my friends can definitely attest to, I'm pretty fervent in saying it's a must as a great imaginative escape. Now, I mean, some people choose heroin, but I think it's much better, and you won't suffer, of course, the ill health effects from reading a Christopher Moore novel uh, that you would get from heroin. At least I, I hope not anyway. So with that, are you conscious of it? And does it affect how you want to leave your legacy? Like when Christopher Moore leaves the world, is that something that you think about? I I really don't I don't think much about I think about a, my body of work sometimes you know because now there is a body of work um, you know but then I meet like you know I've written finished sixteen novels I'm working on my seventeenth and you know fifteen of them are in print and that's okay you know that's that's not horrible but. I went to a romance writers conference one time. I was invited because my publisher was there and it was in town. And so I went and I, I sat at this table with all these um, women who write romances and they had written hundreds of books, hundreds. The woman sitting next to me, I go, well, how many books have you written? And she was probably 30 years old, 32 years old. And she goes, well, I'm just starting out. I've only written 80. And I'm like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so then all of a sudden, that? yeah, because you know, it's for whatever reason you need to like slow your roll a little bit on your grandiose body of work. It's like I just talked to somebody who'd written 152 books <laughs> and they're like 35 <laughs> years old. So, so, and you read, you know, the same thing with like Zane Gray, you know, right? Uh, uh, I think he wrote over 200 novels, and um, you know, it, so. That and an aspect of productivity, it's it's all dismal. Um, in the aspect of being able to, you know, make people laugh, which is really kind of what I do, um, what I hope to do. You know, that's a great feeling when someone says, "I, you know, my doctor told me to read your books because it would help my cardiac condition." Or more touching is like I was going through, you know, my mom having surgery, and I read your book, and it kept me from being insane or whatever. And and I, those are. Those are really flattering because you can't you can't shoulder that kind of responsibility when you're right when you're making the work. You just have to do good work and in my case try and make it funny. Um, but uh, and I and I think somewhere in that calculation is where bringing a sense of humility to the page is is what is more important than bringing some uh, uh, notion of yourself as a grand artist or something like that it's, you know like okay ultimately you're communicating with people and you may not know who that is that you're communicating but you really have to do your best to resonate with some nameless person out there it i don't i don't really even think about what i'll be thought of after i'm gone you know i mean is my my legacy i i'm flattered sometimes because i have the, those people like vonnegut and tom robbins and uh and uh, Douglas Adams, who I go, okay, these guys, basically, if there hadn't been a Kurt Vonnegut, there would have not been a me. The same way if there hadn't been a Richard Pryor, there wouldn't have been an Eddie Murphy. And if there hadn't been an Eddie Murphy, there wouldn't have been a Chris Rock. And that's sort of, and I know that because when they bought my first book, they said, well, we don't know what this is, but Kurt Vonnegut and Tom Robbins do weird shit and they do okay. So <laughs> we'll try this kid out, you know? And I, I mean, that was yeah. actually what they said in the editorial meeting to each other. So really? I know if those guys hadn't done what they did, I wouldn't have gone into print because they used them to rationalize that it was possible to 
be successful writing whimsical comedy fiction. So now I'm starting to find people, you know, in their interviews saying that my stuff was an influence on them. And I'm sort of like, really? You have any idea how little I know what I'm doing? <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it's it's really flattering. I mean, it's really cool. I I, I don't know yeah. how I I don't know how well I fit into that suit, but um, but I, I like it. I mean, it's, I'm I'm flattered. It makes me feel old, but I'm flattered. <laughs> There's a, I suppose a certain responsibility to it. You know, and again, to not be grandiose, to not say that what I'm doing is more important than what it is, but to simply say, well, man, I'm having influence on people that uh, that are going to continue to make art and influence the next generation of people. And my stuff sort of gets stolen all the time. Well, I'm sure it and, does, um, but I, I wasn't aware. Yeah, all the time. I mean, we I watch TV with my wife and she's furious, like everything we watch because she goes, that's yours. And I'm like, it's okay, honey. It's fine. Um, really? Do you have yeah. any examples of that? I, I'm, uh, I'm really just, I'm really curious about that. Well, I've, I've had, well, one of the things is you have to understand when we, when I go into that conversation, I know that ideas are not copyrightable. So just because I had an idea about something, beta males, for instance, um, does not necessarily mean I own it, you know, but there's actually been television shows that we had to send cease and desist orders to because they had so blatantly stolen stuff that I'd done that clearly what they thought when they read one of my books that this was a persistent myth that had existed in history because sort of that's what the show does is it rewrites you know myths and legends through history and puts them in a modern context and this wasn't uh, my book soccer blue was the whole thing with the the muse being attached to the color and all that, that was completely mine. And um, whoever swiped it evidently didn't realize that, you know, because they were taking shit like Faust and all this public domain stuff and rewriting it. And um, yeah, my stuff was, you know, five years old at the time, if that. And uh, so that's a, that's a really sort of upfront stuff. Um, I had, a couple, I've had a couple of things. I don't work in Hollywood very much. And, and really, if I do work, I get fired. Um, <laughs> but I uh, but I had an instance right after my first book was published. And I didn't know what I was... I, my agent had set up all these meetings with producers. And I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I honestly didn't. I didn't. I hadn't aspired to be a screenwriter. I didn't study it. I didn't know the business of it. I just was... You know, Disney had bought my book. And so all these producers had set up meetings with me. And I was... I didn't know I was supposed to be pitching. And then a couple of them said, well, do you have any ideas for me? And I said, well, I was thinking about this would be maybe a good series kind of thing. And it was really a, as a notions that I had had because I wasn't there to pitch. I didn't know how to pitch. What, and I didn't, wouldn't know how to write a screenplay if I had, a, had pitched. Um, and, the, and a couple of those things ended up <laughs> on the screen and they were directly traceable to those producers. But the kind of thing I'm talking about that happens on a night to night basis is, you know, a, a joke or a concept or, you know, somebody will riff on, on, on something. And, and there's times where I go, look, that's just the universal unconscious, you know, um, like, like things that I tweet will end up, you know, four days later in, in somebody's comedy show. Well, I, those people didn't steal from me. They just were looking at the same source material that I was and having a comic reaction to it. So, so, you know, I, I but she doesn't get that. So she's always going off on it, but, but the fictional stuff, it's, there's little tropes that, that, I, I could see, okay, that probably came from me, but I'm not actionable about it. And you have to make a decision early on when that starts happening is, do you want to live a life of litigation, of litigation? You know, and I, I don't, I don't, because one, it's probably not going to be provable, you know? Um, and in the cases where it has been, I've just had, you know, my lawyer send him a letter going, you really need to stop, you know, because you swiped this. We're not going to sue you, but you really need to stop this now. But you know, I, specifics, the, the most blatant and specific one was a television show that ripped off uh, my, my novel, Soccer Blue, for a, an episode of their show. And one of the producers later on, it was really funny, he, uh, a friend of mine had uh, met him at the rap party for that same show, a friend of mine who's a writer and, and writes kind of humorous stuff. And I guess this producer pitched to him one of my <laughs> Shakespeare books. 
And it's like, yeah, it's like he hadn't, it hadn't been enough that he ripped off one. He's like, okay, we got caught ripping one off, but what if we can have someone else write this idea? And, um, and my buddy said, I can't do that. That's Christopher Moore's concept, you know, like right there to the guy. <laughs> that's yeah. cool that he, um, but then he, yeah, that's cool that he, I wonder what happened. What did the producer say? Oh, I guess, you know, I mean, I, he didn't, well, see, my buddy didn't know that this guy had these, this show had ripped me off. And he wrote to me and he goes, funny story. Last night I was at this rap party for this show and this producer said something, something. And I said, I can't do that. My buddy, Chris Moore already did it. And the guy went, oh, okay. And I said, well, interesting story to tell you. And that is that these people have already ripped off my stuff and clearly they're not done. Um, but, uh, you know, I, again, you know, I don't get as, as much as you think I might get all or one would get upset. I don't. I mean, and the other thing, too, is if someone went on and had like Game of Thrones success with something I, that was my idea. Yeah, I'd be pissed and I'd be litigious. But that's not what's happened. You know, it's just been an idea, a joke, a line, a concept, a, you know, a thing here or there. And, and, and uh, it's not going to haunt me forever that someone else had success with an idea that I came up with. Yeah, well, I'm going to be on the lookout for it now, for sure. Yeah, if, if we had sued the network over this, well, hopefully they won't. The <laughs> hopefully they won't, you know, play that again because we did send them a cease and desist. But um, you know, if we had sued the ne the network for that episode, I mean, the the what they would have had to pay me for that is like three grand. You know, that's you know a, a lot of a lot of people. I mean, there's this is an inside baseball thing, but when all these things, especially now, these novels that are being made into series, the authors are not making a ton of money off of them. They're not making crazy fuck you money off of them at all. They're making, you know, wow, three to five grand per episode. And that's if it's a network. I... Um, no, it's much less than the writer's actually making. It's much less than, I mean, the writer of the, of the script. And it's way, way less than any of the actors are making. Or not, maybe not the guest people but the the regulars are making and and it's that's okay i mean i'm not you negotiate that and it's your decision when you sell it what you're going to make but it's not you know the the point the reason i bring it up is that you know you're there's going to be a number if you sue somebody and that number is going to have to reflect what someone actually gets paid for it plus some punitive damage so unless you get you know after you've paid the the expense of of a trial once you get um you know, you'd have to have a jury want to give you serious, crazy punitive damages for, for somebody stealing your stuff. Um, otherwise you're going to get, you know, three to five grand and that's not even going to begin to pay your lawyer. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not. Yeah. And, and a lot of young writers and I, uh, and I had this experience too, is you think that everybody's, you know, set out to, to steal your stuff. And, and the truth is that it's cheaper for someone to buy your stuff than it is for them to, to steal it especially if it becomes successful and if they think that there's, it has a potential for success. Well, with your stuff, I often wonder, when am I going to see a Christopher Moore book turned into a movie or a series? I mean, I could see Lamb being one or seriously, even Blood Sucking Fiends to You Suck to Bite Me, uh, all three of those books and the, the Vampire Trilogy turned into a series. I think that'd be really rad. Well, both of those, those, those two things have in common that they were, they were optioned by producers at a time when it was like, okay, that seems like a good idea for me, you know, cause they weren't, there wasn't anybody beating down the door, you know, to, to so I optioned them out. I optioned, optioned out Blitz Looking Fiends like in 1995 cause I, I had a tax bill due and it was like the guy was going to give me like exactly the amount that I needed to pay the IRS. I was like, oh yeah, sure. That's what I need. Um, and, and you know how an option works is that it, most options are, you know, they pay you a, a, an amount against purchase price. And that sort of rents the property for a year. And then it, usually they can rent it again for another year automatically if they pay you that same amount again or, or a, a negotiated amount again. And then in the third year or third period, if it happens to be 18 months, then you decide, you know, they decide you're either going to have to renegotiate the option they're going to have to buy it. Someone has maybe have started it in production, in which case you start the whole purchase price and production bonuses on it, or you take the property back. 
you have the option to, you don't have to negotiate with them again after it expires the second time. And in both the cases of lamb and blood sucking fiends, I wanted to take the property back because it was clear to me that these guys weren't going to make the movie. And they both came up with the cash to buy it. So um, it's theirs. And, I, and at that point, you can't say no. You've already negotiated that this purchase price is whatever it is, $300,000, $500,000. And if they come up with it, it's theirs. And that's what's happened with Bloodsucking Fiends and with Lamb. And the guys that own both those properties don't seem open, in to, open to making them. I think the one guy is, is just not... I don't understand it. the the guy the the guy that has Lamb just doesn't seem interested. He get, I know he gets approached by pretty top flight producers, certainly of stage, all the time, and he doesn't want them to ruin his movie. He's never going to make with a stage play, and uh, I I don't have any control of that. I haven't spoken to the guy. I don't even know if I've ever spoken to him, but I've I have certainly haven't in ten years. So there's nothing on those horizons, but it doesn't mean that that's because nobody's interested. It's just that the, those properties are locked up. And um, um, one of the networks has a dirty job right now, and they're in their third year of optioning it. And they've got a pilot script and so forth. And um, I'm trying to think of something else. I've gotten a few of them back. I mean, pretty much all of them, I think, except maybe the Fool books have been bought or optioned at one time or another. Well, I'd love to see it happen. I mean, as long as it's done well. I think that's the important part. That's the other thing is that you think, well, I'd just love to see that. And then you see something that you you love. A good example of that to me is uh, um, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, which was a, a book that people loved and said, oh, gosh, I can't wait to see a movie. And after it was made, everybody went, yeah, we don't need to see any more movies of Tom Robbins' stuff. Um, and, and same with Carl Hyacin, who... You know, everybody thought, and, and his books are really filmable, but they made strip tees and it had a big budget and a top light cast. And it was like, no, nah, let's not do any more Carl's books. Um, so, so it's, uh, that happens. I mean, you, you, when you first start out, you're like, if they would only make a movie. And then after you've been doing it a while, you go, if they'd make a good movie. Yeah. No, it has to um, be done right for sure. Yeah. And, and Lamb, I never thought Lamb would be a good movie. It's too much book. And, and you would end up, telling the same Jesus story everybody else has told because you would have to cut it so much. But a 10-episode miniseries or something like that, yeah, it would, it would be awesome um, in the right hands. But, you know, that, but I don't think that uh, the guy that owns it agrees with me. You know, he's old school motion picture. He should just give it to Netflix. Let them do something with it. Or HBO. Or, but yeah, he's not even pitching. Yeah, HBO or, or, or Cinemax. I've always thought the HBO model since the time of the Sopranos has been the way to do uh, Lamb, but but nobody, uh, the guy who owns it doesn't agree with me. But the other properties are, you know, they've been in development. They've gone, you know, the stupidest angel got down to where they were hiring the caterer and their financing fell through. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go to LA tomorrow, so just let me know where I need to go. And well, yeah, right. As if I had any sway okay. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because if I was... If I was con- yeah, if I was connected, I would I would I would be having this conversation. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, just tell them you know the guy. If they're interested in a movie about any one of these seven diverse subjects, you know you know a guy. Yeah, seriously. Chris asked me what I was going to LA for. Uh, like, was it for a screenwriting gig? And if only that would have been. <laughs> would be really awesome. But uh, I told him it was for another gig to simply make some cash, which led to this quick discussion about waiting tables. Ah, okay. Well, yeah. You, and you have to, you have to honor what pays your rent. I always tell people that, you know, you're not too, you're not better than the thing that's paying your rent. That's what you are when you're, and you know, I loved waiting tables much more than I did the other stuff that I did because it was, you know, you could do it well and it wasn't hard. It wasn't hard to be really good at it. You know, when you're writing during the day and you're like, Jesus Christ, this is hard. You know, figuring out, you know, which of the salad dressings that each person gets is not rocket science, you know. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. I loved waiting tables, you know. And it also, it, it, it countered that, um, that social thing we talked about, too. You know, it forced me to be out and in contact with people. And, you know, to the point where, oh, yeah, I hate people again. And then you could go back and write. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, well, I only have one more one more question for you. And, and seriously, before I get to it, thanks again for for doing this. This is really cool of you. Oh, you're you're welcome. You're welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure. I'm sorry if I ramble. No way. That's the other. That's sort of the other. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's 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 sort of the other reaction to spending too much time by yourself is suddenly you are talking <laughs> to somebody. You know, like the guy will come to fix my water heater, and I'm like, "Hi, have you always been a plumber? Did you like being a plumber? Would you, did you always want to be a plumber? What's a, what's a plumber's breakfast like?" Um, right. <laughs> so when I get, I go to do, uh, when I go to do a podcast, it's like somebody will ask a question, and it's like, it's like, "How are you? What you want to hear is fine, not like, well, sit down because I got about an hour and a half of how I am." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, no, that's cool. I I enjoy it. So all right, not, well, you're gonna have to edit me. it, but but go ahead. What's uh what what's shoot? What's the last question? All right. Imagine that one day you're walking through Shinjuku National Park in Japan on a beautiful spring day. The cherry blossoms are practically singing. The weather is that perfect temperature that makes you wonder why you've ever felt like throwing any computer out any window, but also makes you wonder why you've ever needed one in the first place. Suddenly, time stands still. In fact, the Swedish couple to the right of you and the Japanese family to the left of you have all frozen. It's as though time has stopped. A spacecraft the size of a Mini Cooper appears and now it steps an alien. This alien looks and talks very much like Amy Poehler. Aliens evidently from this world, take on the appearance of popular humans and is wearing a t-shirt on it that says, I love Charlie Asher, but does not blink much, if at all. The alien explains that she's been sent here to collect data for a government job that she has on her home planet and that you have been selected as the sole representative of Earth to describe just how in the hell you see and understand life on this planet. What would you tell this alien? Oh man, no pressure there. I, we are carbon-based life forms. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Carbon-based life forms. Yeah, I, See I, you later. <laughs> I mean, well, life on the planet is pretty, I mean, I did a, a whole novel on evolutionary biology with the only, the most remote grasp on the concepts. Yeah. I mean, it's basically life on, on the planet started as sand you know, it's different crystalline silicon structures that happen to get organized <laughs> until they became big, fluffy, um, big, fluffy organic molecules. <laughs> and for a period of that, and then they replicated themselves. And so a fe- period of time, about three to five billion years ago, the entire planet was covered with these big, fluffy organic molecules that soon started to distinguish themselves into various species by adapting to the various conditions in which they geographically were present. And now you have, uh, as Douglas Adams would say, digital watches. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Any questions? (laughs) Yeah, that's a that's a bit life on this planet is that's yeah, uh, that's my best explanation. Yeah. Let's say the alien took it a little bit further and asked, well, what about your social constructs? How do you interact with one another? I guess, what does it mean to be human in a social sense? I think I think that you'd, you'd say that we're a work in progress. So basically for the first two million years of our existence, we were, what we did as human beings was governed mostly by DNA and the imperatives to survive and the selfish gene. When culture first evolved, which is probably maybe 10,000 to 20,000 years ago, we started trying to corral all those baser instincts into cooperative behavior. And it hasn't, you know, given the fact that we have world wars pretty consistently, it's we're not doing that well. Um, but on the biological stage, we're doing fine. We just aren't extinct yet. So I, I, I mean, yeah, but I mean, we're it's an experiment. I mean, I started that whole premise with the fact that that we're we're, we're definitely a work in progress. Most definitely, I don't think anyone would dispute that. 
So that concludes my interview with Christopher Moore. And that was awesome. It was really cool of him to take time out of his day to do the interview. I really recommend checking out his website at chrismore.com. Moreover, checking out his books. They are all really awesome. So I started off with Lamb. Maybe you want to do that. Give it a go. It's really great stuff. So anyway, thank you for listening. I really do appreciate it. I'm going to be moving to L.A., so I may be off the grid for a little bit, but I'll be back. And uh, let's see what happens with this with this podcast from here on out. Love you.